So if you could all take a seat, we'll start our first talk of Rethought Fest. So opening for us is Faisal Saeed al Mutar. He is an Iraqi-born writer, computer geek, and a human rights activist. He is an advocate for secularism, human rights, and the free market of ideas. Faisal is a huge fan of the intersection of technology and advocacy. As such, he is on the editorial board of Applied Sentience, a multi-university project and platform for the next generation of humanist and secular thinkers and activists. Their mission is to find beauty in the world and explore how to live in it. Tonight, Faisal will be talking about secularism in the Middle East. Please welcome Faisal Saeed al -Mubar. I guess I should open my. Uh, oh, I don't need a uh, headphone. How are you guys? Great. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank, thank you, Nicole, for putting me the first speaker. So I'm going to kind of energize everyone here, uh, hopefully. And uh, secular Bengali blogger who was shot, who was killed yesterday by Islam. So I hope you take along the sounds with me for um, another life that was lost. What's, what really hurts me is um, not only these continuous terrorist attacks that's happening and seeing the world on continuous fire and like every day you see like on the front pages of whatever newspaper you read it's going to be tons of people killed and, um, and when the terrorist attack in Brussels which you know, not, I mean very recent happened um, it was kind of like the first time, and I'm very like always on social media, kind of like social media freak. And like seeing many of my friends who work in the media and, and, and so on, who say, well, we expected that. And this kind of is becoming the norm right now. It's like when, whenever there's a terrorist attack happening in, in Iraq or in Bangladesh or Pakistan and so on, we, we kind of became numb to this. And, and that's actually what kind of makes me more sad than the terrorist attacks themselves, is how much um, w like, and, and I understand why people are getting up. And what's what I'm really noticing is that, like, when the moment you look at the media, it seems like as if nothing has changed. You see that uh, the same people mostly show up on the media, and they see, it seems like they have a template right now. So before it was Paris, so we condemn the attack in Paris, blah blah blah. Then when it's in Brussels, they just changed the name from Paris to Brussels, and they say the same exact thing. And and then we expect the same right, uh, response from um, people like uh, Mr. Trump and, and his, uh, his followers who can obviously gonna say we should ban Muslims and we have the solution and, and so on. So, so what I, um, considering that I'm one of the few privileged ones who kind of escaped the Middle East and now live um, privileged in New York, and somebody who's fairly well read and educated and connected, um, I kind of took it as one of my duties to speak for those who um, get killed every day in Bangladesh. And, and now that I'm uh, from Iraq, um, we can, even though I mean the speech is kind of titled for the Middle East, but we kind of have the same struggle because we all have, to some extent, the same enemy. And through this speech, what I would like to to do is. Uh, not necessarily only showing the statistics that there is a rise, which is kind of a good one, the huge rise of secular um, activity and secular views in the Arab and the Muslim world, uh, but also how can we, as, 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 as long as we here in the West, is that what can the West uh, play a role in creating a, a rational uh, counter extremism strategy to reduce amount of terrorist threats here in the West as well as back home in Iraq and so many other places. And first of all, I would like to start with terminologies because um, if I, I, uh, Mark Twain said something very interesting. He said, all generalizations are false, including this one. So I try my best to be as specific as I can and uh, to give as much uh, possible information as I can. So one of the first terms I would like to use is the, is the term the Muslim world. So the Muslim world are the people uh, it's made of people who subscribe to an identity as well as a religion called Islam. And it could be a person raised in 
Saudi Arabia, or it could be a recent convert in Milwaukee, or whatever we are here in Madison. So, and these people in the Muslim world, they belong to a spectrum, and let's call them the ideological spectrum, the Muslim ideological spectrum, from 10 being a literalist, who is uh, to zero, being a cultural Muslim, or the equivalent of a secular Jew, or an ex-Muslim who may keep some parts of the faith, but not necessarily believe in the supernatural or the doctor itself. And so it's a spectrum from 10 being an ultra-ultra conservative to zero being non-religious or atheist. And there is a kind of a parallel spectrum, which is the political spectrum. Sorry for this, this is weird. Uh, the, the, the political spectrum. And these people, as I mean, it's like happening in, Christi in Christianity, there are Christians who just want to live their lives, and Christians who have political agenda. The, uh, and they want to impose theocracy. Sometimes they're referred to as uh, Christian rights in the, in the Islam, Islamic world. They're called Islamists. And, and, and they believe that Sharia law is the way to, uh, to live. And, and if you look now, no, the uh, slogan of the Muslim Brotherhood is Islam is the solution. So that's, that's, that's an example of, of Islamists. And they, the difference between Islamists and those who want to impose theocracy and jihadists, like people like ISIS and the Taliban, or so on, is that with Islamists they believe in using democracy to achieve their means, or to some extent using democracy against itself. So they work on the grassroots level, try to convince people of how Islamism and how Sharia are wonderful, and uh, they try, try to win the vote through that, just like what happened in Egypt, in which the Muslim Brotherhood, right after their spring, they were able to get elected as well as in, in so many other places. I mean, in Iraq, after the US invasion, uh, we had the first elections, and the uh, Islamist parties were able to win elections as well, because they were able to mobilize. And there are the other groups who, who are the jihadists, ISIS and so on, who believe in opposing Sharia, who believe that it could use violence to achieve that goal. So the difference between Islamists and jihadists is, is pretty much the means to the, to, they, they differ on the methodology of how to reach Sharia law. And, I mean, some people refer to them as moderates, but like the difference in moderate is like, ISIS believes that gay should be thrown from the 12th floor, and Muslim Brotherhood believe from the 6th floor. So that's like the, med the moderate right now. It's, it's really amazing how ISIS has lowered the standards to the way that throwing gays from the 6th floor became a moderate position. And, um, but, but also the thing about the Islamists, or the ones who, who believe in political Islam, uh, they're kind of very less direct in, than jihadists in their language. And so they have the ability to convince liberals that they are on their side, at least Western, Amer Western American liberals, and uh, they, they convince the conservatives of the, uh, that they are, uh, the Muslim conservatives that they are on their side. So one of the examples that I've noticed like in the media for, for those who actually live in the United States, the Islamists live in the United States, so they say, like, we support same-sex marriage, which is kind of interesting, right? Uh, but that's not the end of the sentence. They say they support same-sex marriage because we as minority should stand with other minorities in supporting that. So in that way, they were able to send this signal, is that they convince the liberals, like, look, we are here on your side, and they are able to convince the Muslims who live in Muslim-majority countries, who are not a minority, that it's okay if you kill gays, because you're a majority there, so you don't need to worry and we are applying the rule for only when we are a minority. So in that way, they so so like they can meet, and some of them actually, I mean, occupy positions in think tanks and and uh, uh, and so on. Is that they can meet up with President Obama or Hillary or Bernie and have a very wonderful meeting, and because they talk about minority rights and liberal values and so on, and then they can meet with the King of Saudi Arabia and also have a wonderful meeting, because they are able to send a message that can resonate. To, if you know the specific details, you can know the loophole there, but if, uh, but so they can send, uh, so that's why, like, for example, they joined forces, and uh, at least some of them, at least now with the Bernie campaign, there are some folks who are involved, involved there, is that, so they, they also hate, they also say that we hate Republicans, that they're bigots and so on, it's, uh, so it's not because, because many of them are theocratic, is that because many of them are the other kind of theocratic. So one of the quotes uh, of DR that I always remember when he was asked during the Cold War, is like, why do you support the fascist Nicaragua? And I'm going to use bad language, but it's his fault, not mine. And he said, he could be a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch. So, so with the Islamists, they hate the Republicans, not because they are 
that are theocrats. It's just that there are other kinds of theocrats. Um, so they found that through the mutual hate between American liberals and, and, and against Christian theocracy, they are able to join forces with them by, uh, by fighting against, against the, the, the Christian right. So, but there's another group, which is, I think, is very important. There is now, thank goodness, are kind of getting into the media and people like uh, Majid Nawaz, I don't know if you're familiar with him, he shows showing up on CNN and, and some other uh, and venues, and uh, my friend Nasser Romani. And uh, so they're, they're the, what I call the consistent secularists. They're, they're more, uh, some of them identify as Muslim, some of them identify as not, um, who, who are consistent secularists, who support secularism in Muslim majority countries and support secularism in Muslim minority countries, like, like the West. Um, not the ones who try, try double faces. And they're a minority, and they're, but they're a growing minority. And, uh, but it's, it's a minority that is facing uh, kind of uh, two wars at the same time. They're facing a war waged against them by the Muslim Brotherhood and, and so on, who want to destroy their, their image. As well as, unfortunately, it is, it is waged, waged with them by the, by the apologists, who many of them um, belong on the left side of the debate. So, because with, with, um, with, the, with, the, with the left, I mean, I won't generalize, obviously, on the left, but there hasn't been a very big problem of um, siding with the minority just because of siding with the minority, and at the same time, ignoring the minorities of the minorities who belong to that minority. So, what's happening is that when there is an attack happening by Trump, of, let's say, ban all Muslims and all that far right rhetoric. What's happening is that many of the many of my liberal friends, what they would do is that they will defend Muslims unconditionally and they will defend Islam unconditionally. And by doing that, they are to some extent fighting against the voices of progress and change in that part of the world, in the Muslim world, who try to change Muslim Islam to be a more progressive religion. Because the, imagine if somebody says Oh, there's no such thing as racism in America. Or there's no such thing as homophobia in America. By saying this statement, you are actually, by default, de facto, fighting against the gay rights activists and the, and the, and the, and the feminists and the anti-racist activists and good black lives matter and so on, by not acknowledging the problem. So by not acknowledging the problem, the, and, and, and kind of, so today I kind of like wrote uh, a message, a short message to my liberal friends. And, and whenever like, I start a conversation with them about ISIS and so on and Al-Qaeda, and they always say, like, we created ISIS, we created the Taliban, we created... And it's like, oh, we, we, we. And it's very self-centered. They always say, like, how self-centered you are to think that all the world revolves around the United States. And, 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 and don't understand, by, by doing that, they are removing all the agency of the, of the part of the terrorist group and the people who support them ideologically or financially. By saying that, uh, that's, and that reinforces the notion that people who are from the Muslim world or who are very involved in this, and like who come from these countries, their no responsibility whatsoever in fighting against the ideology of Wahhabism because you're taking all the agency away from them and saying, no, it's our fault. Like, I'm a white person and I feel so guilty about it. So, and, and the people who love that are, are actually the terrorists themselves because in that way they're not going to face, face any internal opposition in their home countries. And there are many voices who belong to that, but unfortunately, when the liberals do that, they are by default standing, not intentionally, and I'm sure many of them have good intentions, but side with the voices that kill the Bengal workers. And I'm not denial whatsoever. Uh, I mean, as somebody in the United States invaded this country, so I'm very, I'm, like, if you want me to criticize foreign policy of the United States, like, be my guest. But, or even the Israeli foreign policy and so on. But who I, I think it played a role in the rise of, 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 of terrorism. But to deny the agency of the terrorists, to, to, to deny them what they have worked so hard and to achieve and to believe is not helpful and is dangerous in my opinion because by default you're fighting, as I said, by fighting against the, uh, the forces of change, the, the Raif Badawis, one of the 
amazing Bengali, sorry, amazing Saudi bloggers who started a group called the Saudi Lib uh, Liberal Network, who is now jailed in Saudi Arabia, who was spreading the values of rational inquiry and in the country as extreme as Saudi Arabia. And the, the feminists of the Middle East, the gay rights activists, the secular bloggers, and many others. And the people who are in constant threats by Islamists and their uh, and, and, and jihadists. And I, I'm asking my fellow liberals, because I'm a liberal for at least most of the time, at least not on the subject, but uh, to be on the right side of history. Because it's never too late to stand and, and start focusing on that uh, uh, policy because it's, I mean, that's what I do for a little bit. My research is all focused on how to find activists and, uh, and the other organization you will see, the movements.org, is, is an organization that we try to use the technology of crowdsourcing to help activists, and uh, secular activists mostly, in the Middle East. And, and here's a simple policy that I propose to, to actually do that. And, we, and, and one of the best ways to do that, to fight against the radical radicalism and so on, is being able to look at the spectrum that I was talking about, and not to generalize on Muslims that are either peaceful or terrorists, because both sides are wrong on that subject. And we have to single out those who subscribe to the ideologies of ISIS and all the ideologies of Al-Qaeda from the moderate Muslims who want to just live their lives and feed in their families and have represent no danger to Western societies. And while, and also, we have to support the secular Muslims, the, the true secular Muslims, the ones who really stand for liberal values and the women's rights and human rights, LGBT rights and so on, not the ones who have devil faces, the one I was talking about, who, who say I support free speech, but generally whatever comes after the but is the most anti-free speech you will ever hear, most anti-free speech. Same thing with says I support women's rights, but. So, and obviously when it comes to fighting against, which I think is very important, um, fighting against extremism is, is, is fighting against what extremism harms the most, who are, who are women. In, the, in this closed society, especially women in the Muslim world. So one of the most important ways to, to, to achieve that is to support women's rights activists over there and to empower as much as we can and whenever we can, as well as, well as supporting the, 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 the liberals who, who, who live there, including ones who are non-believers, but with, with funding and technological support as much as possible. And they're like, if you look at movements, you will see like, there are so many amazing projects that are now popping up about like a project called, for example, Free Mind TV, which is uh, using uh, like web television to support um, like spread the ideas of uh, secularism, and liberal thought, and so on in Arabic to Arabic-speaking audience. And there are so many. So, so for example, they ask like, "Oh, can you help us with social media? Can you help us with graphics?" I'm sure many people who sit here may have some of these skills who can contribute. And and there's there's another page. Um, in science, called, called I believe in science, even though they, they, they kind of changed that, said like science is not a belief system, but um, they also is about spreading the values of scientific inquiry and, and so on. And I'm helping them to some extent by interviewing famous scientists, and, and, and there's like a huge um, hunger for all of that knowledge now in the Arab world that I think we should utilize to the maximum in combating the ideology of Islamism and jihadism throughout social media, through our mainstream media, as well as whatever tools necessary. And by promoting the ideologies that are counter, and I mean, I'm not only proposing a very radical idea, except the fact that I get called radical a lot, um, is that how is, what is the best way to, to end gays getting killed? Is to support people who don't support gays to be getting killed. Duh! I mean, it's not really that much of a radical idea, but, but the moment that I've noticed is that the moment you shift the, the, the terminology, so, and I was having a debate in Northern California, and I, I said, what do you call a Republican, a conservative Republican who is against gay marriage? Then he said, I call him a bigot. They said, thank you for calling 90% of Muslim bigots. Then he said, I never said that. Okay? And by doing that, so what, what he, what, what's happening is that there, there is a double standard happening, is that you can say you support same-sex marriage or gay rights here when you're talking to white people. But the moment you talk about people of color and so on, the moment is that, oh, it's their culture and we have to respect it and we have to tolerate it and so on. And by doing that, we are giving excuses to those who throw acid on women, those who kill gays, and those who 
do the most illiberal things. So, so I mean, I, I personally I believe in universal human rights. I think that gays in the Middle East should not be killed, and gays in America should not be killed. I'm not going to give excuses to those who kill over there and try to be against those who who are against uh, marriage equality over here. And when it comes to geopolitics, is that obviously the relationship with, between Saudi Arabia and between the United States and the West and Saudi Arabia, including Canada, who kind of signed a, a, a deal or arms deal with Saudi Arabia. We have to look at this uh, relationship relationships with with suspicion because Saudi Arabia and Qatar, as well as Iran, um, have played a very major role in spreading the ideologies through madrasas and so on, the ideologies of Wahhabism, who belong to the ultra-conservative um, sec uh, segments of the spectrum, as well as who built a foundation, or at least a theological foundation, for the most part, to the ideology of now we see of ISIS and Al Qaeda, and, and as well as so many other groups. And and one of all, also the ways to do that is those who are apologists, those who apply double standards, those who always say that we should be against the bigots over here in America, but we should execute the bigots over there. We should shame them all the time in public and media. I'm doing my 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 work over here um, because they are. I would I would consider that those apologists who stand with the Islamists, who stand with these people who kill. Are, are one of the most dangerous and delusional people and we have to fight and, and that being said not to fall in so we, we, at the same time we're fighting against the regressives the regressive leftist the term I the what has coined we should not fall into the fear mongering of Donald Trump and Teddy Cruz who try to ban all Muslims and, 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 and put them in surveillance so so it's it's much better to have a much more rational approach in which we don't generalize on Muslims. At, at the same time, we acknowledge that there is a problem with, with the conservative interpretation of Islam, and as well as that those who subscribe to the ultra-conservative as well as the conservative views of Islam. So, that brings me to the, to the second subject. How, how much time do I have, by the way? Five minutes? What? You have more than that. Keep going. You've quite a bit of time. I have 20 minutes, that's good. That's good. So, so, because I would like to touch um, a, a very important um, subject, uh, or at least a very major topic on the discussion of secularism in Islam and in the voices of secularism, is that in, in the, because of this growing obscurism that has made it almost impossible to have any discussion about secular Muslims or secular Islam without getting called names left or right, and I have called, I've been called a bigot, racist, Islamophobe, Uncle Tom, and my friend Majid Nawaz was called a porch monkey, um, is that the moment you just touch on that subject, the moment that you have entered like a battlefield of hate from the, the far left and the far right, I mean, the moment that I actually start becoming um, right, like Kevin Greider, uh, at least in the American media, I mean, it's like before in some other venues, but, um, is that I started getting the emails of how much I'm a terrorist and I should be kicked out from the country, which is weird, and how much I am um, a racist against my own people and I'm Uncle Tom. Is that the moment that I entered that subject and, and that the debates, unfortunately, concerning Islam and Muslims has, I mean, I assume that there are so many debates in America. That's kind of a very big problem. Is that discussion has became so polarized and it's very hard to be in, like. Uh, it's very hard to have an honest conversation without being put in one cap or the other. So, so if, if you put some criticism of Islam, you're immediately going to be put with Dick Cheney and George W. Bush and Benjamin Netanyahu, and like, oh, okay. And then when I'm defending the rights for Muslims to, to, to uh, some of them immigrate to America, and I immediately get lumped into a terrorist apologist and, and so on. So, the, so, so that's. Uh, what we need to, we are able to have a much nuanced discussion without getting sucked in into one group or the other. And, and I, since I've doing some research on the media, I've identified kind of six main groups that talk, mostly talk about Islam. And, and there's one group that is my favorite and the rest uh, not my favorite. But the first one would be the Muslim conservatives. They, these guys don't really show up much in the West, but um, who believe that Islam is perfect, the Hadith is perfect, 
the general view that liberalism is a Western invention. I mean, one of uh, and I'll, can I, Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera Arabic, which is kind of very different than Al Jazeera English. Just so you know, Al Jazeera Arabic is the Fox News of the Arab world. It's one of the most conservative, right-wing, crazy channel. Uh, but in the English, in the English, uh, Al Jazeera English, they talk about gay rights and minority rights and. And, and well, you just switch to the Arabic, it's like gay should be killed. You switch to English, we support same sex marriage. Like, okay. Uh, so, so they shop a lot on the Arab Al Jazeera. There's a guy called Al Alawi, uh, who, who, and so many other folks who talk about um, uh, a cosmic war between the Muslim world and, 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 and in the West that generally like, support the, the quote unquote moderates. Uh, in, in, in Syria, who are not really moderate, I mean, there are moderate troubles in Syria, but the guys that Al Jazeera talked about are not really moderate. They're the ones who believe in throwing gays from the sixth floor, not the. Um, so, so, uh, so these these guys generally like view, as I said, liberalism, secularism, as all some sort of uh, the enemy, and we should uh, um, we should sometimes they advocate for violence. So. They don't really engage much in the, in, the, in the Western media, but the ones who do engage in the Western media, who, who also consider Islam to be perfect and inerrant, and, but they don't follow the same interpretations as the Salafists do, the, the hardcore ultra-conservative. But at the same time, they always say that Islam is of peace, and Islam has nothing to do with Islam, and these terrorist groups are anti-Islamic. But if you push them harder, and ask them to, if they're going to call ISIS an Islamic, then they should call Iran, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan as non Islamic as well, but they don't. Um, and, and, and their views on human rights uh, differ from, I mean, most of them I would consider to be conservative, they're not ultra conservative, but they're not supportive of, 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 uh, of gay rights and, and, and what we call now as women's rights. I mean, they, they support women's rights, but um, According to their own definition of women's rights, that I'm very skeptical of, and, but but at the same time, so when it comes to acts of terrorism, so for example, with the Paris attacks, this is the Charlie Hebdo attack, um, they they will always try to say that this is about the West itself, and they're always going to shift the blame hundred percent towards the West, in which they they say, well. Uh, Charlie Hebdo brought it to themselves, and I've seen so many of these articles in Al Jazeera and so many others. Is that Al if Charlie Hebdo never, never wrote something, ever drew a cartoon about Muhammad, then they, they would never have been killed. But they brought it to themselves. What a disgusting thing to say after, after people getting murdered. And, and whenever there's a terrorist attack happen, happening in the West, they will always shift it to oh, but if the United States didn't intervene, um, that would not have happened, or something of that sort. I mean, when, I, when the Bengali workers. Uh, case happened, even though I, I try not to make jokes, but I, I try to use sarcasm to deal with these situations, is that I said if, if Bangladesh didn't invade Iraq, probably the Mughal is never been killed. By the way, Bangladesh never invaded Iraq. But um, I was just trying to make the point that these beliefs that these people have have been existing before even the United States came to existence. And the values of, 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 of killing the blasphemers and the people who don't subscribe to the idea of values of Syria have been existing for hundreds of years. Not to say that the Western foreign policy has not played a role in the rise of, these, uh, of this extremism, but to deny that these values of extremism have nothing to do, to say that they have nothing to do with Islamic history or Islamic doctrine by, say, by itself, is a pure delusion. And so they, they will always say that, that it's all reaction, all these organizations are a reaction to what you call your colonialism. Like whenever, I mean, ISIS, they always say, well, but if Bush never invaded Iraq, there would never be ISIS, or some of that argument. But 9-11 happened before Bush invaded Iraq, just so if people remember 9-11. It was in 2001, it was in 2003, when Iraq invaded, it was invaded by the United States. So that the values of, of the Taliban and the values of jihadism has been existing since, I would say, the beginning of Islamic history. And so, so not to say, as I said, not to say that Russian foreign policy didn't play a role, but to deny that these, I always have to stress this point, is that to deny that these values have nothing to do with Islam is, is very dangerous. But the people who are not dangerous, that who are Muslims, or, uh, who call themselves Muslim reformers, either they, they, they do believe as many after Christian enlightenment happened, they do believe that 
that the, 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 the Quran is the book of God, but at the same time they don't subscribe to it. They don't think it's perfect. That's hundred percent true. And at the same time, uh, they don't think that the commandments of the Quran are applicable in the twenty-first century. And they rally against extremist interpretation and conservative interpretations. And they try to support liberal values. And as I said, people like Majid and Asra, and people in Iraq like uh, Jamal al-Din, um, I wish you can Google him, and he has some videos, I think, in English, who also talks about secularism and in Iraq. He lives over there, and he's trying to advocate for that, as well as, I mean, there are politicians like Ad Alawi and, 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 and so on, um, who try to advocate for separation for church and state, and, and uh, Muslim state in that location, um, and support like li liberal values, true liberal values. And, and the people who stand against them, as I have mentioned before, are the, are the pseudo-liberal apologists who, who tell them that, no, it's all about us. Like, it's nothing to do with Islam. All of what you guys are fighting about is, is, is just uh, wrong. And if the United States never existed and Israel never existed, uh, everything will be fine. And that way they, by de facto, stand against these, these people. And, and, and they also stand against the people who are not necessarily Muslim, but, but people like me, and who, who are, I would say, ha able to differentiate between Islam as an ideology and Muslims as, peop as people, and not generalize on, on Muslims as terrorists, but at the same time have genuine critic. It's like somebody can, I'm sure as many of you have, considered that this is an atheist event, have a problems with the Christianity, and, and have disagreements with the Christianity. Me being, have a disagreement with Islam doesn't make me a racist. And I should not make anyone who is a critical of Islam just for the sake of criticism or of disagreements to be a racist or somehow supporter of a neoconservative or whatever the shit they are coming up with these days. Um, but rather care for human rights, women's rights, and, and so on. So, so, I mean, looking at the Pew Paul research, looking at many of the research done on the value like uh, women's rights and LGBT rights, you see that the amount of people in, in countries that are moderate, quote unquote, as Egypt, or even Indonesia, which is always cited as the most moderate Muslim country, and so on, you see that there is a. I mean, um, I mean, I don't remember the exact uh, number, but I think it was Nicholas Kristof from New York Times, like said that only like 34 percent of Indonesians believe in like killing gays. But if you look at the number, like 34 percent is like a hundred million. That's a lot of people. I don't know if you think that's a minority, but to me it's not a minority. To have hundreds of millions of people from across 1.5 billion, which is already a big number, like 10% is not a small number, I mean, you can do the math, but 10% of 1.5 billion people is not a small number. It's hundreds, 100 million, it's 150 million if it's 10%. If it's more, it's more than half. And, and the numbers keep showing up. There is much more than the people who believe in, I mean, leave aside, the, the, the terrorism and so on, is that just the people who believe that gays should be killed, people who believe that women, women who show, show their hair should be killed, these are a significant amount of people. It's just like, not like one or two who are spreading out across social media, but rather it's a, it's a very a huge problem. And we have to, and those who, who call it out, are, many of them do it as a pure concern for the human rights in these, in these countries, but many are afraid of saying that because, I mean, one of the terms my, my best friend Al Rizvi uh, coined is the term Islamophobia phobia. Is the, is, the, is the phobia, is the fear of being perceived as Islamophobic versus actually caring about human rights because of the ego, because many people, especially who are white, tend to be afraid of sounding like the redneck next door. So what they do, they, they try to not to sound any way judgmental or any way harsh. So in that way, they will not look like the, 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 the next person. And so, uh, without differentiating between that there is a difference between Islam as a religion and Muslims as people. And there are so many names who are, I, 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 I consider to be pure genuine critics, whether they were people who identify as ex-Muslims or people who are uh, non, never been Muslims. Um, like Sam Harris, Bomar, Samar Rezdi, Al Rizvi, as uh, my best friend, Sarah Haider from ex-Muslim North America. Um, and and, and Sam Harris wrote a wonderful book that I recommend people to read. It's called the Islam and the Future of Tolerance, which kind of a discussion between somebody who's genuinely critical of Islam and 
at the same time, somebody who believes in the reform and changing the situation. Well, it's, a, it's a very small book, you can read it when you're flight get cancelled. Um, so, one of the main, unfortunately, because of the, of the left um, not talking about this subject um, honestly and rationally, they have created a huge vacuum for the actual xenophobes and the actual bigots or the people who say they are xenophobes or bigots, like Mr. Trump. And, and so many, I mean, if you look at Europe, Europe is, is going through hell right now. With the, whenever there's a terrorist attack, you will see that there is a huge rise of far-right groups, including groups like the Nazis, including groups. There's a there's a party in France called Marie Le Pen, which is a far-right nationalistic party. The moment the Paris attack happened, the moment they saw that the leftists are incomplete, they're going to say no, it's nothing to do with Islam and so on. The moment that the people who just want to have security gonna be sucked up to, to vote for the right-wing parties, and you can see it now in the United States. Whenever there is a terrorist attack happening. The Democrats or so on say no, it's nothing to do with Islam and so on. The people who are going to be left out to talk on the subject. That's the reason why I always try to speak up to bring that liberal solution. Um, the all people going to be left out to talk on the subject are the crazy right wing Christian and fundamentalists, the Christian fundamentalists as well as the Jewish fundamentalists, and the so the, who will try to generalize on Muslims. So we'll say that all Muslims are fanatics and, and try to ban some of them, and also say that fundamentalism is only the Form, the only form of Islam, and all those who subscribe to modern interpretation and so on are, are a bunch of, of, of liars or trying to deceive people, and, and, and everybody, every Muslim is trying to impose Sharia law, and we should ban all Syrian refugees. So it's, it's, it's mostly they engage in fear mongering and, 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 and pushing for agendas that have nothing to do with human rights and nothing to do with secular liberal values. but. Some of them either are theocrats who are against Muslim theocrats for, because they have a different form of theocracy, and uh, some of them engage. I mean, I mean, you have noticed this with President Obama, in which some people called him a, uh, a secret Muslim. Uh, I mean, I mean, Obama drinks, probably smokes. Uh, uh, he's probably the worst Muslim ever. Like, um, and he has like uh, trying to impose Sharia law. Um, and there are like, people like Pamela Geller and, and Robert Spencer who always generally show up in right wing media. And if you look at Pamela Geller's Facebook page, it's like whenever there's a shooting happened, it's like, oh, Obama Muslim tried to take over guns. All her posts are like, like most of them, not it's generalized, but most of them are like, Obama left wing Islamist taking over guns. It's like mostly that like, crazy right wing rhetoric. And everything is like, uh, the Democrats infiltrated the government with jihadists and they want to bomb all of us. Uh, so, so what happened is that when the left ignored the subject of Islamic extremism or Islamist extremism, uh, they have created that vacuum that, I mean, many of my, many actually of my gay Arab friends or gay ex-Muslim friends that I've talked to who live here in the United States, and they will always say that if there is a major terrorist attack happening in America or there is any, I may consider voting for Trump for security because of that vacuum that the, that the left has created. Because if the, if the left is going to acknowledge the problem and deal with it in a rational way, then people like Trump and others would just sound crazy, which they are, but, but sound crazy to those who are not really crazy, who would consider, may consider voting for them just for the sake of having security and, um, and, and, and safety and fear of uh, Islamic terrorism and so on. So, it is very, very important to look at the, the intention of the people who criticize Islam and, and, and not to try to and try to get, uh, uh, see if it's reasoned in a, in a reasonable way and, and, and what would the difference between a genuine critic of Islam and those who are pure, pure xenophobes. So that's probably the end of my speech, but if, for those who are interested, I mean, there I have flyers at the end and I think one at who are for the organization that I work for and try to help secular activists in the Middle East. So thank you so much for listening and my reason of, uh, and science of blessed United States of America. Thank you. I thought I spoke more than I should, but um, yeah. I think I have some time for Q&A. Testing. Testing. I think I've met you before. Yeah, I've met you before. How do you suggest people?
I'm not sure I understand the question. I, mean, uh, I, I don't want to blame my English because I think I gave a good speech in English right now. But um, it was like, like, can you? It's, it's, it's weird. Yes. Oh, you mean like trying to find a middle ground with people that you agree with or disagree with? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you're talking about like finding a common ground with, uh, with, with or, or, I mean, on the internet, obviously, it's not the best place to have a conversation online. Uh, I don't recommend it. But um, I, I mean, if you're talking about helping the people who are there and who, I mean, that I agree with or even disagree with, and I, and I sometimes work with people I disagree with on some issues. I mean, obviously, I'm going to work with people who believe that gays should be killed. Uh, yes, I, I mean, through movements of work. I mean, it's a platform in which many of the people who uh, belong to all across the spectrum, anyone who supports human rights and, uh, and secular values, uh, uh, would be able to join and help the people over there who believe in these values. Um, maybe if. Yeah, I mean, I think speeches like this or media appearances and. Uh, uh, can definitely help in achieving that goal. I mean, there are people who I think, uh, uh, if they like, I don't think my message is too radical, so I don't really think that I'm a polarizing figure. But um, if there are people who are polarized by my speech, then they have the right to comment whatever they like or uh, retweet me, uh, just so they can bring more haters. Hey, Faisal, how's it going? Hey. I'm probably loud enough to where I probably shouldn't have a microphone. But um, I was going to ask, I mean, I, I've read the Pew, the Pew polls as well, and you kind of mentioned that like the extremist thought has been around for a while. And I agree, but I, I wonder what the percentage of people, if we could go back in time in the 1950s and take those same, same polls, that is the same amount of, you should die for apostasy. Is that, it feels like to me it's on the rise. Things like hijab, um, wearing and way to identify your group and create identity politics are yeah. like that. If you look at you know Afghanistan, you know yeah, in the sixties yeah. you don't see it. Like where is this coming from? I mean, is it all from the Saudi Arabia? And why isn't the American government like putting more pressure on them? Why why can't we mount you know a, some some way to try to stop this? Well, I mean, I work, don't work with the U.S. government, so I cannot give you. Uh, um, I mean, yes, there is, I, I mean, um, I think possibly because this was a long time ago, it's really hard to take statistics, uh, and there's no, like, you cannot, uh, at least not accurate ones, but yes, I mean, there has been a rise with extremism, I would say, I mean, since the Iran Revolution, 19, 1979, um, and, I mean, you can see with Iran, the, the pictures of, like, with women, how they're free versus now, um, and also, because of the rise of Iran, Saudi Arabia started uh, getting more mobilized to spread their counter ideology to Shia Iran. Um, and also during the Cold War, because the United States and the Soviet Union, um, India was on the Soviet Union side and Pakistan was on the uh, anti communist side. Um, and through United States help, and that was able to create the counter. Uh, Soviets in Afghanistan that were, as you know, probably some of them are not moderates. Um, so yes, I mean, I mean, the, I mean, I think there's like to some extent now, I mean, as we speak, there's kind of a rise of both. Is that because the, I mean, uh, um, many people are kind of get, getting disillusioned with uh, what Sharia is because many, many people study like Islam as well, like at least like basics of Islam. I mean, teach Islam in Iraq since you're eight, but 
the moment they start seeing it, the Muslim Brotherhood and so on, seeing the implications of Sharia, many young people, especially young generation, are like hell with that. I don't want anything to do with Sharia, I don't want anything to do. Some of them leave the faith all the way. Um, so it's kind of like a devil is sword. And, 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 when, and so there is, it, it's, it seems like there is a rise of Islamic extremism and also the thing with technology, which is my field, is that technology is neutral and technology gives the ability to even have a smaller percentage to create a big damage. I mean, I mean ISIS would not be able to succeed in swords as much as they are with AK-47. So, um, so I think that there is a, there is a rise of both in, in terms of secular values, in terms of Islamic extremism, because of technology being able to spread things much quicker way and, and, and so on. Thank you. Well, thank you very much.